Our next presenter from Iran School in the United States of America. Yeah. Aloha. Aloha. Hi. We are at Iolani Schools of oh, Japan Super Science Fair. We hope you're enjoying the fair so far. My name is Julia Page. I'm Julia Kuano. I'm Taylor Mao. I'm Rachel Riedel. I'm Veronica Shea. And we are here to blow you away with our wind tunnel presentation. Here we go. <laughs> so, our research dealt mainly with aerodynamics. Aerodynamics is the study of the dynamics of airflow and how airflow interacts with solids. There are three general types of airflow. They are laminar, transient, and turbulent. In laminar airflow, the air flows in parallel layers, each sliding over the other with no disruption in between. In turbulent airflow, eddies form, typically behind a solid, which causes flow to be unpredictable. Transient airflow is a flow somewhere in between laminar and turbulent, so if you had transient airflow flowing through a pipe, the center of your pipe would be turbulent, whereas the outside area would be laminar. Uh, we measured the forces of drag, and drag is the forces that oppose movement. It is dependent on both the fluid's velocity as well as the object's surface area. There are two kinds of drag. They are friction and pressure. Friction is tangential, so it runs along the object, whereas pressure drag is normal, so it's perpendicular to the object. Uh, in calculating drag, there is the drag coefficient, and the drag coefficient is proportional to the object's Reynolds number. A Reynolds number is a dimensionless constant, which basically tells whether airflow is laminar, transient, or turbulent. A high Reynolds number indicates turbulent, low Reynolds number indicates laminar, and something in between is transient. Uh, when air flows against an object, it does not actually interact, interact directly with the object's surface. The gas molecules of the air stick to the object and create something called the boundary layer. Uh, with dimpled objects, such as golf balls, the dimples reduce drag and increase lift by causing the upstream boundary layer to go from laminar to turbulent, which, um, and the turbulent layer stays attached longer than a laminar layer, which reduces pressure drag. Since we dimpled a car's windshield, we decided to research the history of dimples on a golf ball because that is where we commonly find dimples. The first golf ball made was the feathery cube, which is a leather-covered ball that is stuffed with goose or chicken feathers. The next type of golf ball that was made was the Guta Persia, made from the gum of the Malaysian sapodilla tree. This ball was a smooth ball, and after a few uses, however, it became dented and nicked. This did not slow the golf ball down. Instead, it went farther than it normally did. So then they created the hand hammered guta, which was made by softening the ball and hammering in the dimples by hand. Next, they created the brown ball, which had a pattern to the dimples, which is similar to that of berries. The last golf ball that they made was the modern golf ball, which established a standard size and weight. This golf ball was a dimpled golf ball. The American golf ball has about 336 dimples. In addition to golf balls, we looked briefly at the energy consumption of the United States. As you can see from this pie chart, 40% of the US's energy consumption is fossil fuels, and half of that comes from cars. So, knowing this, we came up with the purpose of our experiment, which was to determine if the dimples on a windshield can reduce drag and thus increasing the fuel efficiency of cars. For our experiment, we, we, we made 3D printed dimple faces that we would attach to our Voyager model windshield. And we had we varied two different types of things, which was geometry and the distances. For our first distance, we had close spacing, which ranged from between 9 to 10 millimeters. Our second distance was medium spacing, which ranged from between 13 to 14 millimeters. And finally, we had far spacing, which was between 19 and 25 millimeters. And for our geometry, we had rectangular 
spacing and spacing based on equilateral triangles. To build the wedges, we did a CAD process or a computer-aided design process. Um, the first step we did was we drew a sketch of the um, we drew a sketch of a rectangle, and then we extruded the rectangle. We made a um, plane to draw the dimples on. And then we revolved the dimples so that it would cut into the, um, the face. There's the dimple on the side. And you can see that these dimples are very shallow, which is what you expect when you feel a golf ball. And finally, we did a linear or circular pattern to determine the amount of dimples we had. Okay, for, so for our experimental design, we started off with a blueprint, so for a wind tunnel. We had three separate parts, which would be made out of the diffuser and fan, a test center, and a contraction cone. For the fan, we used a gable-mounted attic fan, which would be um, turned backwards, so the fan would be sucking air through the wind tunnel. This reduces turbulence and has, gives us greater control of the airflow. Then we have a test center, which is where we would get all of our data. We have a we have a plywood wedge that we would put in, and this would be connected to two metal rods, and then that would be connected to the test center. From there, we would put our dimples on the surface of the wedge, and with the rods, we can manipulate the angle of the wedge, which would give us the data. Then we have a diffuser, which is connected to the fan. The diffuser slows the wind down before it reaches the fan to make sure we don't damage the fan or anything. And then finally, we have the contraction cone. The purpose of this is to speed up um, the wind speed by Bernoulli's principle before reaching the test center. And then we get our wind tunnel. For the building process, we started off with the diffuser, and we were fortunate enough to get a lot of teachers help for this because we aren't very um, skilled when it comes to hand saws. We were able to cut four equilateral, um, not equilateral, four equal trapezoids and glue them with wood glue for our diffuser. Then we have the same for the contraction cone, which would have a steeper angle. And for the contraction cone, we also used a wire mesh to put on the very side of it. This would be for safety purposes and to make sure there are no extra materials that would get into our wind tunnel. And then finally, we have our test center. And we were very fortunate to be able to use a laser cutter in the new building at our school. We used the laser cutter to cut four um, pieces of plexiglass and we would glue that together. Also, for the test center, we used a straw diffuser which would straighten airflow before we reaching the wedge. With the, to make the straw diffuser, we used the laser cutter once again, and then we placed it to the very edge of the test center. There's our building. Okay, for the data itself, we collected data from two different sizes of wedges. We had a large wedge, which was 22 centimeters long, and a small wedge, which was 15 centimeters long. Um, the first graph, is a graph that we collected from the large wedge. The lines at the top represent the force that we collected when the wind was off, and then the lines at the bottom is when the force, or when the wind was on. So we took the difference between these two forces to calculate the force of drag. Um, this is the data that we collected from the small wedge. Um, the lines at the bottom differ more because um, we took a greater frequency of data. So it fluctuated more, but the average was still fairly consistent. So this is a table of the data we collected from the, from the small wedge. Um, the force was very small, differing by 0.01 newtons. Um, but there was a slight trend. Um, the faces that had the most and least number of dimples had the most drag. So perhaps the the middle moderate spacing of dimples in between would produce the least amount of drag. The geometry made no difference. Um, when we collected data from the large wedge, we saw an even greater trend, this, this time differing by 0.02 newtons. Um, 
And again, we saw that the moderate spacing had the least amount of drag. We also, using our computer program, we were able to run a flow simulation of what would happen. So for our data in the flow simulation, the triangular actually produced the least amount of drag, and the far distance um, produced less than the blank. And for the rectangular, the middle spacing um, still produced the least, the least amount of drag. Also, um, another factor we need to consider in the future would be lift, because these are two images of our flow simulation, and this is the blank one, and this is the dimpled surface, and if you see the airstream on the dimpled one, you can actually see there's a, it goes up higher, so there's more lift on the dimpled surface, which um, would be a factor in cars, because that will reduce your normal force and cause you to have um, less control. Okay, conclusions. So our experiment did have a lot of errors, especially with the wind tunnel itself. Um, we saw that the smoothness of the wind tunnel was not ideal because we used plywood. Um, you know, we would ideally want to use something very smooth to, produce, um, to reduce the amount of turbulence inside the wind tunnel, so we might want to change that in the future. Also, we didn't look at the Reynolds number within the wind tunnel, so there, um, because of the high wind speeds, there could have been a lot of turbulence. Um, when we looked at it, it didn't have, it didn't seem like a lot, but we'd want to test on that later. Um, the dimpled faces themselves were imperfect. Uh, the 3D printer couldn't produce the perfectly smooth surface with the perfectly round um, dimples that we would want to produce. So um, that could have created some of the errors. Um, the low numbers of the drag that we collected also um, didn't maximize the use of the equipment that we used, so it might not have been sensitive enough to detect the changes that we had. And also, um, the wedge itself, the strange shape, so most of the drag probably was produced by the shape of the wedge itself, um, which could have caused a lot of our errors. Um, so the conclusion from the experiment itself, um, we saw that geometry didn't have any effect in the wind tunnel, while moderate spacing is perhaps the best um, format for um, if we were to do, use it. In the flow simulation, we saw that the triangular geometry was the best. Um, it was the only one that produced a fourth drag that was actually less than the blank phase itself. Um, and so basically all the other ones increased lift and increased drag. So our idea is good, but we just need to keep further researching to see how we can fully implement this idea of dimpling. Um, so further research ideas, is we want to look at variable wind speeds so that we can um, produce the best, uh, the lowest Reynolds number inside the wind tunnel, and also to help with the scaling of our experiment, um, perhaps using a tapered sheet of the object, and maybe using a round windshield, because if we want to apply this to windshields, um, windshields are much rounder to use, although they can't be applied to anything. Um, the, we might want to try randomizing the dimples instead of an exact shape, and then changing the depth of dimples themselves. We're excited, all the sources we use. We'd like to thank um, all the teachers that helped us to build this wind tunnel, and we'd like to thank all of you for staying to watch our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? of your idea, um, if you were putting it on cars, wouldn't the dimples like affect visibility? So 
obviously if you have dimples on the windscreen you're not going to be able to see as well out the car so wouldn't that have any effect? Well, the entire um, experiment is very theoretical. We wouldn't expect people to like, not see through their windscreen. Okay. Windshields obviously, but it's more of a theoretical experiment. Um, it's just an idea that I'm just trying to figure out how it works. Um, because you can apply it to something like the front of an airplane where it doesn't matter what it looks like right. and people aren't there. So, but this is a basic idea that I want to try. Great presentation, thank you. Um, I just wondered, you obviously we talked about sort of future ideas to look at the depth of the uh, dimples and the sort of size of dimples and things like that. How did you come up with the initial sort of um, criteria? Because the size of dimples and the depth of dimples, you set that. Is that from scientific papers or just, from, just randomly? Or? Uh, we looked at the dimensions of the dimples. So you probably go down the right line, so thank you. Uh, that, that was a great presentation. I, I really enjoyed uh, just making the uh, the wind tunnel in the first place. That's that's lots of fun. Uh, you mentioned there's a trend when you say, and, and I'm, I'm forgetting what the numbers were now, uh, 0 0.42, 0 0.41, 0 0.41. And you said, okay, that's a downward trend. Uh, I think you've identified, you hit the right thing in, in, when you talked about errors at the end. And you stole my comment, uh, <laughs> which is perfect. Uh, uh, and, and you, so I wrote down your comment, insensitive equipment. Right? We don't know what the real difference is if the equipment is only so sensitive. So maybe uh, that's, that's a great place for future research. And, and I don't know if you have a comment on that, but that was, that was fantastic that you, you picked up on that. It's, it's even been there. What were the wind speeds that you used in your wind tunnel? Um, about 15 miles per hour. Um, yeah, just wanted to say thanks. You deal with like a lot of different factors, and I know that obviously by the comments about visibility and depth, there's certainly a lot more you can do with this project as well. So that was awesome. Thank you. I'm sorry we don't have enough time to quest ask the question. Thank you very much. The presentation was very good.